going on guys? Today the 240SX is going to be getting a 5 plug conversion as well as a fresh set of wheels and tires. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're actually on our way up to New Jersey to hang out with my buddy Chris Fix, hang out, work on some cars, learn a little bit. But before I go any further, let me explain why there's no interior right now. <laughs> First of all, I did not plan this trip well at all. I started working on part two of the interior restoration where I'm going to be putting sound deadening down, new carpet, and some other stuff, so I had to gut the interior. I'm also working on putting in a completely custom audio system, but I didn't think that after I took all this stuff out, I would have to immediately go to the Dodge Demon press event, and then when I came back, I would have to work on those videos, and I wouldn't have any time to finish all of this before I left for New Jersey. So brilliant thinking on my part. <laughs> so I figured I guess I'm just going to drive the car to New Jersey without an interior. This ought to be interesting. And I quickly realized how stupid of a decision that was. First of all, driving this car with no interior sucks. <laughs> it's, it's not the noise. Like, obviously it's incredibly loud, but it's hot because I took up all the insulation and everything, so all the heat from the floorboard is making this thing like a giant toaster on wheels. And it's been raining off and on, making it even worse because this car, the air conditioning doesn't work in it. I have not fixed it yet, and I'm not gonna fix it until we put the new engine in it. So I'm like, oh my God, this sucks. <laughs> Other than that, smooth sailing. The car's doing well, and I'll see you guys in New Jersey, and we'll start taking some stuff apart. Bye guys. So the first thing we have to do is get the car up in the air. To do that, I already have this on coilover, so it's lowered to the ground. We're gonna have to do a little bit of finagling, get it up on some ramps so we have good clearance to actually get the jack up under the car. Once we do that, we can get some jack stands in there, do the same thing at the back, check, make sure everything is stable. After that, should be good to go. So I'm trying to update this car as much as possible, put some modern components and stuff, and the five load conversion just seemed like a natural fit. For one, it greatly opens up the different wheels or aftermarket wheels that you can get on the car, and by doing that, I can get larger wheels, I can get wider wheels and fit a wider tire to benefit handling and all of that stuff. On top of that, you get to refresh some of the suspension components because the ISR kit that I got through in Juku Racing actually has brand new wheel bearings in it, so that's gonna be pretty nice as well. In addition to that, the larger wheels that I have are going to allow me to fit a big brake kit all the way around, so this thing is going to stop on an absolute dime. When you're changing to five lug hubs, you also have to change the discs because a four lug disc is obviously not going to work with a five lug hub. My car is a, an S13, a 1989 model. I ended up getting a set of discs from an S14, like a 95 or 96, uh, specifically the ones without ABS because my car doesn't have ABS. But the nice thing about doing this is that it's all plug and play. The discs are the same size as what came on my car, plus I can use the existing caliper and all of that kind of stuff. While you're doing this, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and replace your pads as well, depending on how worn they are. I'm not going to be doing that in this video because, like I said, I'm doing a big brake conversion. I'm completely trashing all of the factory equipment. So everything that I'm doing today is for temporary purposes so I can show you guys kind of the process and kind of get my hands dirty and have a little bit of fun with it. All right, I think I'm ready to get started. I, I think I know a general process, but uh, can you walk me through this, Chris? Yeah, definitely. The first thing we wanna do is remove that dust cover. Now we're starting off by removing that dust cover because we wanna make sure that we could get that nut off, and in order to get that nut off, we have to remove that cotter pin. Success. Finally, we have to remove the spindle nut, so just break it loose and pull it out all the way. Now we gotta remove the caliper. To do that, there's two bolts right behind here that we have to take out. All right, what next? Now you wanna hang that up with a wire or a bungee cord. Okay. Okay, oh. there we go. 
So before putting the new hub on the car, the last thing I have to do is to take out the washer from the old hub and put it in the new one. Now, I mentioned earlier that the new hubs come with new bearings, which is definitely a good thing because my car has almost 160,000 miles on it, and as you can see with one of the front hubs, it's pretty much on its way out. There's a lot of play inside that's not present in the new one, and all the grease is coming out. It's, it's, it's pretty bad, so it's a good thing we're replacing it now. All right, now it's time to put in the new cotter pin. Well, I always seem to underestimate how long it's gonna to take to do something like this when you're trying to film every little process and learn about it all at the same time. So we're running out of daylight, so I'm gonna finish up the back tomorrow morning. But now that everything on the front is finished, I at least wanna test fit this wheel and just kinda of see what everything is gonna look like after it's all said and done. I'm just so excited. Let's see. There we go. Oh man. Looks so nice. Job was, well done, everybody. That, awesome. <laughs> that looks so good. Oh, I can't what wait. What a difference. So, I got some center caps to go in this later. I have to take off these red decals and put the, the black and silver ones. I guess we'll see tomorrow if I need to do any rolling, but yeah. fingers crossed it just fits perfect. But we'll see. Good morning, it's day two. Now let's go ahead and start tackling the rear. So the first thing we have to do back here is remove the cotter pan. So you remember on the front, we had to remove that dust cover before we could get access to the cotter pin. There's no dust cover back here, uh, you know, to get to the axle nut, but once you take the cotter pin out, there's still another little like metal cover thing right here that you have to pull, and then you have access to the axle nut. Now let's break this nut loose. Nice. Now we gotta take off the two caliper mounting bolts. So that way it wouldn't work, so I'm going to try to go under here to see if I can get some extra leverage. Ah, success! That was a stubborn one right there. Now, the emergency brake for this car is integrated into this caliper, so before you try taking it off, you need to take the emergency brake off, otherwise it's gonna be just about impossible. But, all we gotta do like the front is just get a little bit of leverage in here, and just go ahead and start sliding it off slowly. And there we go. Just gotta find a good place to set it so it doesn't fall or tug on the brake line and take the disc off. Okay, so now the last thing to do is to remove the hub. Now I've seen a lot of people take off the control arms and all of that. I'm gonna to try to do this a little bit simpler because the axle can rotate freely now. So there's four bolts on the back, two on each side. It's pretty tight back there, but I think you can rotate this in a way to give you just enough clearance to get a socket wrench back there. So we're gonna give that a try and see if we can keep this simple and not have to take all this stuff apart. So Chris recommended the use of a swivel head ratchet, which is gonna allow us to really get in those tight spaces that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get into with a normal extension bar or, or even a socket. So let's see how this works. Yes.
Okay, so explain to me what, so this is a slide hammer? Yeah, you just thread that on there. What do you do with this? Once you get it threaded on, you're gonna slide it, that, what's on your hand right now is a big lead weight, you're gonna slide that back, and it's gonna bang out that ferret. Okay. Perfect, yeah. There you go. Nice! That's really cool. <laughs> nice tool, right? Yeah, it is. It makes your life so much easier. Nice. Hub time? Hub time. Oh, this and then hub time. Get all this reassembled. So, brake rotor and caliper bolts. This is hard. <laughs> Is it okay to grab it right here? Yeah. Ah, here we go. All right, moment of truth. Let's put the other wheel on. Thank goodness these are light, relatively. So let's go ahead and talk about these wheels and tires. I ended up going for Volk Racing TE37 SLs and Pirelli P0 Nero GT Summer Tires. The wheels are 17 by 9 inches at each corner with a plus 22 offset and they're made of forged aluminum so they're super lightweight. The tires are 245-40 and should offer a lot more traction than the standard 205 or 215 or whatever it was with the 15 by 6 inch wheels. I am super stoked by how they fit up to this car. I did have to get all four fenders rolled a little bit, which went off without a hitch and you really can't tell from the outside of the car except for the back a little bit, but they fit perfect. Aside from rolling the fenders, I had to dial in a little bit of negative camber, two degrees out back, one and a half degrees up front. It seems to be a pretty good setup, might have to do a little bit more adjusting as you know I keep driving the car and feel it out, but I'm really liking how this looks. The only other thing that I'm going to have to spend a little time on once I can jack the car back up and take the front wheels off is modifying the front fender liners because when you turn the wheel too far left and right, the tires want to rub on the plastic liner and it's not a big deal. It doesn't hinder the way the car drives at all. It's just more of an annoyance in like low speed maneuvers, but that's something else for another day. The only other things that I had to do were cosmetic. When the wheels came to me, they were shipped with red anodized valve stems and red TE37 SL stickers. You've already seen the stickers in some of the previous clips, but I changed out the valve stems when I got the wheels mounted to the tires. The other day, I swapped out the stickers and added some Volk Racing spoke stickers. I'm not sure what they're actually called. I'm not sure if I'll leave those on it. Um, just kind of feeling it out, but everything looks really good with the whole black and silver thing going. And being that this car doesn't have any red on it already, they look way better, a little bit more stealthy, I guess. If you guys remember way early on, I actually bought a set of old R32 GTR wheels to go on the car. You know, just temporary until I figured out, you know, the wheels that would actually go on the car permanently. I can't tell you how hard of a decision that was to find these wheels. It was incredible. It took months. <laughs> The GTR wheels are 16 by 8 inches and I had 22550 Cooper RS3 G1 all season tires because when I was thinking about doing the 5 lug conversion earlier this year, it was still pretty cold outside and I wanted something to give me a little bit of an extra performance edge so I can kind of dial in the car and figure out exactly the direction that I wanted to go. But 
in the midst of all of that, you know, with project cars, it's so hard to keep on a consistent time schedule. Things got pushed and pushed and pushed, and then I decided, well, instead of doing like a Z32 brake upgrade, I wanted to do something crazy. So I ended up getting this massive Willwood big brake kit for the front and the rear. So the front is eventually gonna be 13 inch discs with six piston calipers and 12 inch discs in the rear with big single pistons that actually integrate the emergency brake. Before leaving New Jersey, Chris and I actually went to a Club Loose event at Raceway Park. He was going to take the drifts thing out there and have some fun, and I wasn't going to take this out because I already have way more money invested in this than I should, and I just I didn't want to take a risk on breaking it. But I had actually never been to a drift event before, so I was like, heck yeah, that sounds like an awesome opportunity. And it was. It was a blast. I'm going to close this video out with some of my favorite shots that I made that day. We saw some incredible vehicles. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Huge thanks to Chris Fix for hosting us for a few days. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot and I can't wait for the next video. Be sure to check out his channel for an in-depth look at how to do the 5 luck conversion, including all of the torque specifications and the right tools needed. It's pretty cool and it was especially cool for me because I got to see the video being made and how much work Chris puts into each and every one of his videos. It's very impressive. Once again, everyone, I hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like below, and if you're not already subscribed, be sure to. You definitely won't regret it. There's always a lot more where that came from. Take care, everyone. Yeah, just to get